ready for the word today? <clears throat> Good. I'm ready to give it. Father, in Jesus' name, I commit myself to you, and I ask you to speak to me, through me. I ask you to also speak to me, and may this message be the oracles of heaven to our folks today in the name of Jesus. And everybody who agrees, say amen. amen. All right, today I want to talk to you about one with Jesus. Now, let me make this statement quite clear, that when you were born again, you were made one with Jesus because of God's decision to accept you into the family. So you're one with Christ. But there comes this other side of it, which is this. I have to want to be one with Him. Every day, I, gotta, I have to want to be one with Him. And it's the same thing in life. You know, you don't hang around people that you don't want to be around. You just don't do it. You hang with people that you want to be with. And the beautiful picture that we have, of course, is always marriage. That uh, if, if you have a fruitful marriage, you have two people who want to be together. Uh, there are people that are married and they just go through life. They, they despise each other, hate each other. But because of the kids and the money, they just make it work. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being in love with someone. And the more you get into that relationship, the more you love them. Well, Jesus loves you that much, but the question is, are you willing to go a little bit further, a little bit deeper with Him every single day? And so what the Father says to be one with Jesus is to be wrapped in Him. Now, we're entering into a season now. We're in the fall season, and, uh, and we have these little cool blankets that some wonderful church gave us. Um, <clears throat> and so, you say, where that came from? Well, we gave it to our workers a while back, but anyway... These are all over my house, and uh, when it starts getting cool, they come out. And they take these blankets, and they become one with them. And they wrap themselves up. And you can't tell the difference between them and the blanket, because once you're all covered up, you all become one. This is what it is to be one with Jesus. But it's a decision that I make. I have to be willing to come close to Him and to become one with Him. All right, so this is how, where we're going to start it off, one with Jesus. So I want you to wrap yourself, get this mindset, you're going to wrap yourself in him. All right, so Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2 says this. This is something that jumped out at me this week when I was just reading, and, and it's almost like what happened with Tina in her readings this week. Something came alive on the inside of her that says, listen, when you feel like you don't have anything, just take what you got and pour it out, and you pour it out until you're full. Well, this is similar to that in my life when I read this, and it's not the full scripture. So you can go back and look at Ephesians 1 verse 2, but I'm going to share with you what I got out of it, and it's simply this. Made holy by being one with Jesus, the anointed one. All right, now look at this. Made holy. That is, when I'm being made, it's a relational process that's happening every single day. But I am made holy by being, I am made holy by being one with Jesus. I am made holy by being one with Jesus. I am made holy by being one with Him. So every day, every moment, when I'm aware of His presence, every day when you're aware of His presence, not just in the morning when you pray, but all through your day, you're aware of His presence. You're aware that He's promised to never leave you, never forsake you. So you're always looking for His goodness. You're always living by faith. And this is an effort that you've got to put forward. It's nothing easy. It doesn't come cheap. But you've got to put forth an effort to keep your mind fixed on Him. Your affections drawing towards Him. Everything is about being one with Him, and in being one with Him, made holy. Amen. And you're made holy by being one with Jesus, who is the anointed one. Now, Jesus is the man who manifested God's outcome in this world. Jesus manifested God's outcome in this world because He had a promise. So the more I hang out with the promise of God that He gives to me, the more then that word will be made flesh in my life, the more I'm being made holy, but I'm being made holy by being one with what he says to me. All right, so I'm, I'm going to give you some stuff to think about. 
You got to go back in your life. This morning in our prayer time, Missy came up. She was actually shaking. She says, in my prayer time this morning, the Lord spoke to me. And here's what he told me about where we are in life in this ministry. A phenomenal word from heaven. I said, write it down. I want you to date it. I want you to give me the time. I want you to script it out. I want you to put down what God says to you. I want you to put it down for me. Because she came to me with the word. And I, and I know this. That if I take that word and hide it in my heart, I will be made holy by being one with that word. So what is Jesus saying to you? That ought to be the meditation of your heart. It should be the time that you give to something. What is he speaking to you today? Tina had a word. The more I come before my day, if I find myself being emptied, but I pour out what I do have, this little bit of oil called I love you, I worship you, I pour it out. The more I pour it out, the more it's going to fill me up. That's the word. So if she hangs out with that word and she gives honor to that word, that word will make her holy. This is not rocket science, but it is an effort that has to be put forth. So I'm made holy by being one with Jesus. Now here's something that he shared with me. Can you please now take this? Because I will... I, I would like to be wrapped in it, but not on the floor. <laughs> Alright, so in my, con in my thoughts and in my meditation, something new came up on the inside of me. That... Um, I would, and when I've been reading the book of Ephesians, there's a term that's been jumping out at me called the realm of heaven. The heavenly realm. So I've asked the Lord over months, Lord, what does that mean? The heavenly realm. The realm of heaven. What does that mean? And so the other day, in my private time, I came across a reading that had this statement in it, but it just reflected so well to what, it was almost like, you know, it was like the bell rang. Bang! You know, Ms. Gale said her brother rang the bell when they diagnosed him, said, you're cancer-free, bang, ring the bell. All right, so when you're searching for Jesus and you're kind of at a loss, you're not sure what it means, but you know the answer's coming. When the light goes on, bing, ring the bell. All right, so the bell, boom, said this, that the heavenly realm is where God alone lives. He's there. And in that place, nothing is impossible because... Everything has been made possible and alive to us because of what Jesus has already done for us. Do you realize that what Jesus did for us is so complete that Jesus nor anyone else will ever have to go back to the cross? It is done, finished, complete. And in that realm, heaven is operating on the presence of God, on the presence of Jesus, and it's thriving, it's alive, it's active, it's productive. There's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no poverty, there's no crying, there's no sorrow, there's no depression. There's no one being overcome in heaven. Father then says, with that knowledge of that realm, you are to now ask me, well, let me back up. So with this invitation now being one with Jesus, Father God accepts me into that realm. Every one of you who are born again now have been accepted into that realm and you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are already there. But here's the thing that you have to realize is when you understand that this realm is available to you and you've been invited into this realm, it's to, it's to give you access to allow God who is in just, he is infinite, you allow him into your finite. In other words, the other day, uh, I, I've been struggling with some stuff and I feel like, not, not, not sin or nothing, but just discouragement. You know, just kind of wondering like why stuff ain't happening faster than what they're happening. And you just kind of like, come on, man, I've been in this funk for enough, uh, for years now, you know, I'm ready to get out of it. And all of a sudden, the light went on, got to ring the bell, and the Lord says, did you ever ask me to come into this situation with you? And I'm like, Oh my God, I never invited you into this situation. I just never thought about inviting. I thought you were already in this situation with me. He said, well, why don't you go ahead and invite me? I said, well, Jesus, now would you, out of this realm of the impossibility, would you come into my world right here where it seems like nothing wants to change? And the moment I did, something changed in me. By just simply having this relationship that says, thank you that you've, you've allowed me to enter into this world of everything is possible. And now, because of relationship, I can ask you into my world where I'm struggling at today. And he came. And I got to ring the bell. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, the Word of God says this, Nothing is impossible to them who believe. 
What catches my attention is that nothing is impossible to them who believe. So what does it mean to believe? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 this, says this, to, that if you believe, is to believe that He exists. And that He cares enough for you to respond to you when you ask Him. You see, that's what it is to believe. That there's nothing impossible to those who believe that God is good and He wants to be involved in your life, but you've got to give Him access. He said, well, I already give Him access. Well, I do too. I worship Him. I have a relationship with Him. But you know, sometimes I never, I, for several years, I haven't ever thought about asking Him to come into this arena, this area of my life. And the moment I did, the light went on. And it's like, oh my God, that was so simple. What seemed impossible got possible by simple invitation. That's why I believe that the commands of God are all about a relationship. It's about mirroring the reality of what already exists in, in heaven. And so that he can exist now present it to the world that we live in. Remember, everything is about relationship. And so if you're ever looking for heaven on earth, you can always measure it by the importance that you place on His presence. How important is His presence to you? Now, I don't want you to answer it right now, but just think about it. How important is His presence to you? What did you do today to invoke His presence? I mean, did you really do something to invoke His presence today because you treasure Him? Or will you, or, or, or look, because we all have a tendency because of our religious background and setup that we come to him because we have need of something instead of someone. And so my approach then should always be that I value his presence more than anything. So if I want to measure how much heaven do I get in earth in my life, we'll, I believe we'll really start with how much will I value his presence. How much will I value his values? How much will I value his lifestyle? But here's the truth. The more I value what he values, then the culture will now become the culture of heaven will become the culture on the inside of me. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says that all of our direction and ministries flow from Christ. And lead us into a deeper, deeper relationship with Him. Everything that Jesus is doing for us is about getting us to go deeper into Him. It's not about being satisfied where we are today as a people or being satisfied with where we are as a church. Listen, this is not about money, wealth, houses, lands. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about your treasuring Him. And when you treasure Him, He'll cause the stuff that you have need of to chase you down. That's His promise. But in a lot of cases... We find ourselves chasing after the stuff, going to him as a big daddy. Come on, big daddy, let me see what I can get from you today instead of, no, you're going to be the treasure of my heart. All right, to prove this to you, do you know that the Bible says this, that God, and there are names of God in the Hebrew text, like he is El Shaddai, that means he's almighty, he's the almighty God. So what are you searching for today that you won't find in him? He's Almighty. He's Yahweh. That means He is Lord Jehovah. He is God. He is over everything. And what are we searching for today? You see, our search should be in Him. You see, He's Jehovah Nisi. He's the victory banner flying over your head. Do you realize that today? Do you make Him, Jehovah Nisi, the object of your affection? What about Jehovah Raha, which is the shepherd? That He watches over you, He guides you, He leads you, He will always bring you beside still waters. What about Jehovah Rapha, the one who has already said, He healed you by His stripes, you've been made whole. What are you searching for, the healing or the healer? He's Jehovah Shammah, He's forever present. We beg Him, oh Jesus, move in my life. He says, I've never left you, Shab, but you're not looking for me, you're looking for something that I produce. Just find me. He's Jehovah Teskinu. He's the God of your righteousness. You can't make yourself right, but He does. So seek Him out. When everything is yelling at you, you're, uh, you're just unfit, you're unrighteous, you're unclean, you're no good, you know what you did in your past, search for Him because He's your righteousness. What about He's Jehovah Jireh? 
He's the one who provides for you. So when I have need, I don't search Him for a $100 bill. I search Him because He's the one who will provide for my needs. He said, well, I don't know how it's going to come. I don't either, but I do know one thing. By the end of the month, all my needs are met. We've been probably through one of the most slack years we've ever been through in the last several years. But you know what? Everything Jesus gave us, the devil couldn't take it. <laughs> because he's Jehovah Jireh. What about Jehovah Shalom? He's the God of your peace. Come on, think about it. You're not looking for a quiet place where there's no noise. You're looking for a person. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And we could go on and on and on with the names that are revealed in the Word of God, but He's everything you have need of. That's why we can go back to this scripture, Ephesians 4.15. All my direction, all my ministry flow from one person. It flows from revelation that comes from Jesus Christ and it leads me into a deeper, 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 deeper intimate walk with Him who is the anointed head, Lord over everyone. So I don't know about you, but I believe I need greater desire. I need a greater desire to learn how to represent Him in purity and power. That means He has now given me the ability to be like Him, to be made holy. So when I search for him, I thought about this this morning. What about using my faith to move mountains that are hindering me from knowing him? What about me using my faith to discover who I am in him? Instead of using my faith to get stuff, what about my faith getting him? Now I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. I'm just telling you what I'm thinking about today. Where my meditation is. My heart is to know Him. Because in knowing Him, all my needs are met according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How about, let's go a little bit deeper in love with Jesus. How about being made holy as He is holy? I read this in Ephesians and I kind of made all the connections as I read through the book. But being made holy is being in a position of unstained innocence. Can you imagine that the Father sees you in a position of unstained innocence? Why wouldn't you want to chase after Him? The world can point a finger. People can accuse you. Lots of folks can come back at you for the things you've said and you've done. But from the Father's position, when you wrap yourself in Jesus and you're being made holy, you're in a position of unsustained innocence. Oh, man, you want to talk about falling in love with somebody? That's someone to fall in love with. But what does it do? Being made holy releases grace over you. I love that term, releases. So being made holy releases. Being made holy also imparts total well-being into your life. So if I'm being made holy as I hang out and being made one with Jesus, Jesus is releasing grace over me and Jesus is imparting total well-being to my life. Why am I chasing after other stuff? Why am I not completely chasing after Him when everything I have need of is found in Him? So I don't know about you, but I have this, this, this thought that I become most productive when I'm hungry for fulfilling His mandate for my life. Let me make this statement again. I believe every one of us in this place today will be the most productive we could ever be when I'm hungry to fulfill His mandate. You've got to be willing. I have to be willing to learn how to grow. Now, let me make this statement to you. When you're chasing after Jesus, you can't be afraid of failing. Most people will not go further and deeper because they're afraid they're going to fail. But how will you learn if you're not willing to fail? You can never be afraid of failing. Get out of the boat and watch him support you. 
Get out of the boat and walk with Jesus for a while. Get out of the boat and when you do begin to fail, notice how fast he'll sweep you back up and put you right back in the boat. Because you're in his care because you're not afraid of failing. So you're going to get out of the boat and you're going to chase after Jesus. Now I'm not saying or suggesting that you're going to fail. What I'm trying to tell you is that all things work to the good of those who believe that he exists and that he rewards those who search after him and chase after him. Amen. So what if it seems like I made the wrong turn? Grace always makes everything, even my failures, turn out to my good. <laughs> That's what grace does. I don't know about you, but I think these things are so important because somewhere in life, somebody's got to get a breakthrough so that other people can benefit from your, your breakthrough. You know why it's important that we come to church and we do everything in our power to go deeper than we've ever been before? That we're no longer ashamed that we've got to just stay in our seats and that we don't come to the front and worship Him passionately? You know why it's important that we do those things, that we pursue His presence? Because your breakthrough is going to influence somebody else's life. But as long as I'm stuck in my rejection, stuck in my filth, stuck in my little world that I'm stuck in, I'm just like everybody else around me and I need a breakthrough because you need a breakthrough. Everybody in this house needs a breakthrough and you're not going to get it unless you believe that Jesus exists and that he will reward you with himself as you chase him down. Listen, 500 years ago, there was the Reformation that started in this globe. And the leaders of that day were successful in shaping their culture because they believed God. And they believed he had answers for every part of life. They believed that God had answers to the banking business. They believed God had answers to the business world. They believed God had answers to the educational system. They believed God had an answer to science. They believed God had an answer to everything. And they sought Him. And they chased after Him. And He answered them. And He gave them insight. Do you think He's done? Of course not. But he is a God who rewards those who believe that he is God. That he lives in, the, in this world where everything is possible. And he invites you into this world. And now I believe that he is. So I invite him into my world with his answers. So I believe the gospel that we live in and live with brings the reality of the kingdom of God to every part of life. Every part of your life, no matter what you do, from being a housewife to being a gentleman on the job or a stay-home dad and a working mom. I don't know wherever you are, but I want to tell you one thing. Jesus has an answer wherever you're at. And he's got a purpose for your life. But if you don't seek him out and search him out, you're going to live out your days as a mundane, frustrated, angry human being because you can't figure out where Jesus is. Why isn't Jesus taking care of me? Why isn't Jesus helping me out? It's because we're not seeking him for who he is. We want to run up to the little Holy Ghost slot machine. Put in, thank you, Jesus. Cha-ching. Didn't work. They told me if I just praise the Lord, cha-ching, and there's no expectation that I'm going to find him. I'm looking for the reward of the stuff. Ah, okay. I'm just trying to make you hungry for Jesus. That's all. I just want to make you hungry for Jesus. I want to make you hungry for Jesus. You know why? Because I need to be hungry for him. All right, I'm coming to the end of my my theory here. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5 verse 13 says whatever the revelation light exposes this is why you got to chase after him. This is why Dwayne Bland has to chase after Jesus because Jesus is the revelation and light. He says I am, I am the light of the world. So he says whenever the revelation light exposes whatever it does it also corrects. <laughs> And everything that reveals truth is light to my soul. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but apparently I need some correction. Yeah. Anybody here doesn't need correction? Raise your hand. Thank God we have some honest folks. Yeah. Glory to God. But everything, when I spend time with Jesus, 
He brings me to a place where he wants to correct me so he's going to expose some stuff. And here's what I believe Jesus wants to expose. The kingdom-oriented people can influence their surroundings. He wants you to know that you're a world changer. You actually are a world changer. You have the potential of heaven on the inside of you. You can do this stuff. But it's going to take you chasing after Him. Yes. Get up in the morning. Hit your knees. Call out for Him. Surrender your day to Him. Lift up your hands. Jesus, I need you today. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus, I decree that you are Lord of my life. And if I get out of place today, correct me because I need it. I invite you from your world to this everything possible. I invite you into my world to make everything possible. Yes. Yes, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. The Bible says that this is not a wrestling match against a human opponent. I want you to notice, none of us here today are fighting against another human being. We're wrestling with rulers, authorities, powers that govern this dark world and spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly world. For this reason, now he's telling you, all right, you got an opposition. There's, a, there's an opponent to your life. And because of this reason, here's what he tells you. Take up. Be made holy. Be made one with Jesus, the anointed one. Get all your direction, all your ministry from him. Look for revelation light that exposes everything that needs to be corrected. Take up the whole armor of God. Take up what God supplies. 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 Take, up God supplies. Take it up. Yes. Because you want to know why? Because the enemy is always trying to make us more aware of our problems than the solutions that we carry. That's all he does. He tries to put us in a position that all you see is how big your mountain is, how big your problem is, how big that obstacle is, instead of understanding the solution is living in you right now. All you got to do is chase after him. And he's not running from you. He's waiting for you. But he says, if you'll draw close to me, I draw close to you. Uh, Brian shared with me this morning revelation that, that he got in a conference that he went to was just simply this. Jesus has paid it all, but you got to get it. Yeah, it's reserved for you, but you got to take it by faith. You got to believe God for it. You got to hide his word in your heart. You got to say it with your mouth. You got to do the basic things that, that you're supposed to do. And if you think you're not going to do it that way, well, then you're just not going to, you're not going to get it. It's like you got money in the bank and you just talk to the, you just say, that money's going to show up one day. It's in the bank. What you got to do? Well, today you can go online and transfer it. Go to the bank and get cash. But you got to go. You got to take it up. Amen. You got to get what's been supplied to you. All right, so let's finish off with this. Maybe this is some place you can shout. How many of you recognize that Jesus... When he came to the earth to do his redemptive work, Satan tried to stop him. But he failed. He failed. The devil failed. The devil failed. Darkness failed. Why? Because he took up what God gave him. He took it up. He walked in this world just like we do, and he took up what God had for him. And there's nothing at this point that Jesus or God can do more for us because he's done it all. And the devil failed. So here's something I want you to think about. Spiritual warfare is not devil focused. Spiritual warfare is not devil focused. It's focused completely on Jesus. Because our greatest victories always come from our celebration of his goodness and his presence. I'm going to bind the devil, I'm going to resist the devil, but I'm going to worship my Jesus because I know this, that when, listen, Psalms 68, 1 says, I am to let God arise and his enemies be scattered. I'm to do something. I'm to let God arise. I'm to stir him up. 
stir myself up. And the moment I do that, stuff changes. How many of you have ever been in a predicament before and the miraculous thing happened? You stirred yourself up in the Holy Ghost and something changed. Just because you pursued Him. Maybe that ought to be a token of how we're supposed to live. So anytime our focus of prayer and worship is more about fighting the devil, honestly, we're no longer inviting his presence and we're no longer worshiping Jesus because we're more evil conscious instead of Jesus conscious. Now it's just, listen, and it's easy to fall into these traps. All I'm trying to share with you is this. I want to be one with Jesus and I want you to be one with Jesus too. All right, so let's stand up.